and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner in our Washington, D.C. studio. It is good to have you here with us. House Republicans released their bill to repeal and replace former President Barack Obama's health care overhaul, commonly known as Obamacare. The new proposal, called the American Health Care Act, scales back the government's role in helping people afford coverage. If passed, the measure would block federal payments to Planned Parenthood for one year. It would also stop people from receiving tax credits to help pay premiums for plans that provide abortions. Joining me now is Marilyn Musgrave, a former U.S. representative for the state of Colorado and the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List, the pro-life group we're teaming up with for this program. Congresswoman, thank you for being here. It's good to be here. So what do you make of this plan? Well, I'm encouraged. Here the news is rolling out about what the House is doing. And of course, our main concern has been that Hyde protections, no taxpayer funding of abortion in the replacement of Obamacare. So there's a long process ahead, but the information started coming out mm -hmm. and uh, we're encouraged by what we see. You all have been calling for the protection of taxpayer dollars for a while now. Tell us about that coalition letter. Well, amazingly, I mean, when do you have a letter signed on by 60 pro-life leaders saying, Congress, we're, we're telling you, we expect you to have Hyde protections uh, in the replacement of Obamacare. So I think that letter in itself is remarkable, and the pro-life community is saying, we do not want American tax dollars going for abortion, and that really reflects the will of the American people. Congresswoman, can you remind us back in 2010 when abortion funding became an issue when it came to Obamacare, remind us what happened then? Well, those days are so uh, memorable to me mm. because the very issue that could have stopped the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, was the abortion issue. Mm. And we had pro-life Democrats, you know, we have lots of pro-life Republicans, but it seems like fewer and fewer Democrats, but Bart Stupak mm -hmm. and a number of other pro-life Democrats were saying they would not vote for the bill if it had taxpayer funding of abortion. Well, it was heartbreaking to see them cave on that with the executive order right. that was offered to them, but that is why Obamacare passed with taxpayer funding of abortion, the largest expansion of abortion since Roe v. Wade. It was a very dark day. So what should congressmen today take from that if they're thinking, you know, when it comes to voting for this bill? Well, fortunately, we have great friends and leadership, but they know that they will be held to the very same standard as Republicans mm -hmm. that the Democrats were held to back in 2010. And after those pro-life Democrats caved, 15 out of 20 were not re-elected to office, one retired. So it had a very significant impact on them politically mm -hmm. because people do not want taxpayer funding of abortion. As a former legislator yourself, what kind of timeline do you see on this? And is it going to take very long? Well, it's going to take a little while because it has to go through the committees, then it has to go for a, a vote in the House after the Rules Committee, and then it has to go to the Senate through a very similar procedure. But over there, because this is reconciliation, it's mm -hmm. a budget issue, uh, it, it can pass with 50 votes. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's very important because there are not 60 pro-life votes in the United States Senate right now. But you know what I would say as a former member when people contact your office, it does make a difference. And when a number of calls are coming into your office over an issue, you pay attention, your staff is paying attention. So I would tell everyone out there, stay engaged, because mm. every step of the way, uh, we could have something happen here. And we do not want to have taxpayer funding of abortion in this replacement. And, and we have to make sure that we do our part every step of the way to give elected members of Congress, uh, representatives and senators, that message loud and clear. From the mouth of a congresswoman herself, grassroots matter. Thank you so much for being here. It's good to be here with you. Call to Action is a way you can be involved in the pro-life movement. As the Congresswoman mentioned, passing the health care plan and defunding Planned Parenthood will take time, but we need to act now. This week, we will continue to call on Congress to defund Planned Parenthood, this time specifically through the Reconciliation Bill. 
Here is what you can do to take action and make sure your voice is heard. Go ahead and get your smartphone or laptop ready. Go to sba-list.org forward slash defund PP. After filling out your name and other information, you'll be brought to a letter written for your specific member of Congress. The message is this, defund Planned Parenthood via reconciliation. This means that any congressional efforts to replace Obamacare in the reconciliation bill must include provisions that prevent taxpayer dollars from going to fund, subsidize, or provide tax credits for abortion and abortion coverage. If you agree that taxpayers should not be forced to violate their consciences and fund America's largest abortion business with tax dollars, go to this website and send your letter to Congress. Once again, it's sba-list.org forward slash defund PP. Turning now to more life-related news, Mississippi's Senate votes to add gas chamber and electrocution as execution options. Lethal injection is currently Mississippi's only execution method. The state faces lawsuits claiming drugs it plans to use would violate the constitutional prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. The bill now goes to the Mississippi House. Donors and nations pledged close to $200 million for so-called family planning at an international conference held in Brussels last week. The event was a response to one of President Trump's first acts in the Oval Office, reinstating the Mexico City policy. That policy blocks an estimated half billion dollars a year in funding from international groups that perform or promote abortion. The Brussels conference promoted abortion and contraception as family planning methods. The Catholic Church strongly opposes both. Some encouraging life news in the U.S. front. Assisted suicide failed to pass in two states last week. In Montana, a House bill that claims consent is a defense for assisted suicide failed on a final vote in a 50-50 tie. And in Maryland, the state Senate's assisted suicide bill was withdrawn by its sponsor. This stops the chance of assisted suicide from passing in Maryland for the third straight year. Judge Neil Gorsuch's confirmation hearing is set for March 20th. Gorsuch is President Trump's nominee to fill the Supreme Court seat left vacant by the late Justice Antonin Scalia. Trump promised to nominate someone in the same judicial mold as Justice Scalia. To find out more about the judicial giant and how he viewed his role on the bench, we spoke with someone who knew Scalia well, very well, his own son and Catholic priest, Father Paul Scalia. Father Scalia, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's good to be with you. Thank you. So President Trump promised to nominate a pro-life justice to the Supreme Court to replace your father, Justice Antonin Scalia, but your father didn't even like to be called a pro-life jurist. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. One of the, I think, most central things in my dad's uh, jurisprudence was that he wasn't concerned about results. He wasn't results-oriented. He wanted to, uh, to get things right as, as regards to the law and what does the law say and, and what is being asked and, and rule according to that. He wasn't, he wasn't a judge in order to get certain results and he would, he would bristle at the thought that, uh, that that was the purpose of being a judge. Uh, he, he was more interested in the rule of law and clarifying the laws and, and judging according to the law and about the law and not about uh, a, a particular result. And truly a constitutionalist. Absolutely. Really. Yes. Absolutely. Now you, along with your mother, were at the White House when President Trump announced his nomination of Judge Gorsuch. What was it like to be there? The president was uh, very gracious and kind. Uh, I was just there to, to accompany my mom. My mom was the one who was, who was invited. And I got to tag along, in effect, and just, just be there with her, which was a great honor. Uh, and the president, he was, he was really gracious and kind and um, very attentive to, to my mom. And I think it was, it was a very nice thing for him to invite her there. Mm. It was good to be there. Now, your father was a devout Catholic. How much do you think faith should impact how a justice rules on the court? It's, it's a good question. It, it, it shouldn't impact it in the sense of uh, importing particular doctrines into, uh, into one's jurisprudence or rulings. Again, it gets back to the, to the question of what's the purpose of a judge? Is he, is he trying to get particular results or is he just trying to, to rule according to the law? The faith is inevitably going to have some 
impact uh, because it, 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 it determines how, how, how we view things. And um, uh, so to the degree that it shapes character, that it gives, um, it, it imbues a person with integrity and for a res respect for the rule of law, a respect for, uh, for the governing authorities and, and things like that, I, I think that's, uh, that's exactly what, what, what should happen. In my father's case, you know, one of the things about uh, our Catholic faith is uh, as regards morality. We're not mm -hmm. interested in getting the right results and we are interested in living rightly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we live rightly, we'll get the right results, right? You know, we, we, li we live uprightly and we're blessed with, you know, a good job, a good family, home, things like that, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Other times we live uprightly and we don't get all of those things. The goal is not to get something or to establish something um, or to gain something. The goal is to live uh, in, in, in an upright manner according to our Lord's instructions. And I think that that's reflected in my dad's jurisprudence. His goal was not certain results. It was, let's, let's observe the, the law correctly. Let's have that respect for the rule of law. So in the, that's, that's a way I think that his faith shaped things, mm -hmm. not in an explicit way, but just, just I think in the formation of character. Father, thank you so much for your insight and for speaking with us today. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Father Paul Scalia has written a new book on Catholic doctrine called That Nothing May Be Lost. It will be released March 25th. But now for more on Justice Scalia's legacy and what confirming Judge Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court would mean for the pro-life movement, we turn to tonight's expert panel. Ed Whalen is president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a former law clerk to the late Justice Antonin Scalia. And Amy Howe is the founder of SCOTUS Blog, a blog devoted to Supreme Court coverage. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you, Thanks Catherine. Thanks for having us. Ed, you knew Justice Scalia well. So do you think Judge Gorsuch is in the same judicial mold? I think that Judge Gorsuch is an eminently worthy successor to Justice Scalia. Judge Gorsuch embraces originalism and textualism, as Justice Scalia did. He's a, is a very deep and clear thinker. He writes with force and verve. And I think, like Justice Scalia, he's set to have an outsized influence on uh, generations of lawyers. Amy, Gorsuch has written a book on assisted suicide. How significant is that, and will pro-life views be manifest on the bench? It's an interesting question. You know, he talks about the sanctity of life, for example, in the book, but he cabins it pretty carefully. It's not a, a book in which there's a lot that you can necessarily take from his views on euthanasia and assisted suicide and extrapolate them to abortion. And we don't know a lot about what he thinks about abortion. He hasn't really had an abortion case come before him on the Tenth Circuit in 10 years. However, there was a case involving abortion, Planned Parenthood of Utah versus Herbert. What do we know from that? What can we gather about Gorsuch from that ruling? Well, this was a recent case that involved abortion funding and specifically whether the Utah governor violated the First Amendment uh, by issuing a directive that state agencies should uh, not pass through federal funds to Planned Parenthood in light of concerns uh, that came out over uh, videos of, um, I think, misuse of aborted fetuses. As Amy indicated, this, it wasn't directly a case about abortion, and indeed the principles of law that govern the case were agreed to by both sides. But I think what we saw in this case, in which Judge Gorsuch dissented from the um, denial of rehearing on Bonk, uh, was um, his having the courage to call him as he sees them. He thought mm -hmm. that the panel had uh, abused the facts in order to reach a result. Uh, he had the um, courage to point that out and to say, no, this is how the case should have been decided. Hmm. So once again, that had to do more with funding, not so much his specific view on abortion. And it even had even more to do with standards of appellate review, of district court fact finding. But mm -hmm. look, when it comes to trying to understand um, a judge. I think what you'd want to um, look at are the twin qualities of judicial philosophy and mm. character. Uh, as I indicated, Judge Gorsuch embraces the originalism and textualism that Justice Scalia expounded. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he has shown through his record of more than a decade uh, on the Tenth Circuit mm -hmm. that he's um, quite an excellent judge. Uh, and I think he's also shown the second quality of courage, courage to do what's mm -hmm. right uh, under the law uh, no matter um, what the criticism. So those are the two qualities that, that I look for in looking for a uh, justice to 
um, be like Justice Scalia, so to speak. As Father Scalia had said in our previous interview, his father did not consider himself nor would have wanted to be considered a pro-life judge. Do you think Judge Gorsuch feels the same way? I'm sure he does, and I think probably the most important thing, if, you know, if you're looking at what Judge Gorsuch might do on abortion is the fact that, like Justice Scalia, he regards himself as an originalist. You, know, you look at what the framers of the Constitution would have intended at the time that they wrote it. You don't look at the Constitution as some sort of living and breathing document that evolves over time. And it was Justice Scalia's originalist views that you know, led him to oppose abortion. And you know, that suggests that, just, that Judge Gorsuch would do the same thing if he became a justice. How confident can we be that Gorsuch would vote to overturn Roe v. Wade? Oh, I think anyone who says that he's confident about what any uh, justice or judicial candidate would do is, is, is fooling himself. Um, look, I, as a, I think the basic ingredients are, are there, this judicial philosophy and courage. Uh, I uh, believe very strongly that, that Judge Gorsuch would be an excellent justice, so I'm very hopeful that he will get this and other issues right. Um, we'll see, um, you know, when the issue gets teed up. Right now, mm -hmm. uh, if, if Judge Gorsuch replaces Justice Scalia, the court will remain uh, five to f four in favor of Roe. Mm -hmm. So any, any change uh, on Roe is going to involve further changes in composition of the court down the road. And there have been you know, several justices who've been put on the court, you know, two by Ronald Reagan, Sandra Day O'Connor and Anthony Kennedy, and then David Souter, who was put on the court by George H.W. Bush. And in each of those cases, conservatives believed that they would be justices who would vote to overturn Roe versus Wade. And in fact, they were the three justices who in 1992, in a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, joined together to reaffirm the core holding of Roe versus Wade. So you can try to predict what someone's mm -hmm. going to do when you get on the bench, but you never really know. And also, you know, when a justice gets on the bench, they're also grappling with an issue called stare decisis, which is Latin mm -hmm. for the decision stands. And it's the idea that once something is sort of settled precedent, it, it should remain that unless there's a good reason to overturn it. And so that that would be something else that, you know, some if an abortion law were to come to the court, the justices wouldn't necessarily be working with a clean slate. What do we think about Roe versus Wade, you know, do, but also grappling with this other issue of stare decisis? One case that E.W. Chan has been following closely is Zubik versus Burwell, including you know, those religious groups and whether or not they should be forced to comply with the contraceptive mandate. Would Gorsuch's confirmation impact that at all? I think a lot of people are curious. Well, I think what will have a greater impact on that is the election of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump can, in one stroke, uh, do away with the um, requirement that's been imposed on the Little Sisters of the Poor and others, and I believe he's promised to do so. So I don't think we're going to see this issue um, heavily litigated in the courts. It ought to be taken care of by, by the administration mm -hmm. sooner rather than later. Excellent. Ed Whalen, Amy Howe, thank you both for that helpful insight as we near the confirmation hearings for Judge Gorsuch. Thanks Thank for you. having us. When we come back, how living simply can help you say yes to life. We introduce you to a Catholic family who does just that and is getting international attention because of it. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner. In our Speak Out segment, we're calling out this week's A Day Without a Woman protest for their pro-abortion agenda. The protest happened Wednesday, International Women's Day. It calls on women to take the day off from paid and unpaid labor, to avoid shopping for one day, and to wear red. Organizers say it's an act for equity, justice, and the human rights of women and all gender-oppressed people. It was put together by the same group behind January's Women's March on Washington. It is good and just to stand up for anyone who has not shown the God-given dignity they deserve. But this event for women does not represent all women. The group's unity principles clearly states, we believe in reproductive freedom. This means open access to safe, legal, affordable abortion and birth control for all people. 
But this event turned a blind eye to a very inconvenient fact. Most women support abortion restrictions. According to a January Marist poll, 77% of American women support limiting abortion to, at most, the first trimester. 61% of women think it's an immediate priority our government restricts abortion in this way. By including strong support for abortion in their agenda, the Day Without Women isolates pro-life women. How ironic, considering the supposed purpose was to be inclusive. This protest even closed down at least two U.S. public school districts. So what about mothers who couldn't afford to take a day off work? Were they expected to look for child care last minute? But of course, by having a pro-abortion agenda, this event isolates the most vulnerable females of all, the hundreds of thousands of young girls who are victims to abortion each year. If the Day Without Women organizers want to bring peace and unity to our nation, I encourage them to remember the words of a very powerful woman, St. Teresa of Calcutta, who said the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion. Remember, there is something you can do to combat today's culture of death by following this week's call to action. Go to sba-list.org forward slash defund PP. Fill out your information and send a letter to your member of Congress saying defund Planned Parenthood with the reconciliation bill. One stay-at-home mom and one software test analyst have managed to do something a lot of Americans can't, stay out of debt. And they've done so while saying yes to life over and over again, which caught the attention of international media. For this week's Pro-Life Focus, we introduce you to the Fat Singer family. For Sam and Rob Fatzinger, <laughs> <laughs> I say this is reality. Finding quiet time doesn't come easily. Should I unclip and go get them? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> joyful sounds in our house. This Catholic couple has 13 children and one foster child, with ages ranging as young as five up to 27 years old. Are we gonna make a fence? Yeah. I'm making a house. Is it a house? Well, what's that thing? Oh yeah. Well, what's I, what's I the long thing you make? Playmates are in no shortage here. Kind of fun. I feel bad for other people who want to do this one thing or Catch it soft. like another school or they Ready? don't get to play as much. 13 plus kids might come as a shock for some, with U.S. birth rates at their lowest in recorded history. But that's not the most surprising number in this Maryland home. What captured the attention from media like the Washington Post, the Daily Mail, even calls from reality show producers was the number zero, as in the fat singers have zero debt. The family credits mom's simple living style and dad's number crunching skills. I've always been interested in, well, money, but in finances and numbers. I was worked at a bank in college and then when I got out, and Sam's good about um, not the number part, but she, she doesn't like, like to shop or want anything fancy or doesn't have expensive tastes. They even paid off their home in just over 12 years. At first I was like this huge, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then I was like, hey, wait a minute, you know, I've been pin pinching pennies and trying to get cheap cuts of meat and using cloth diapers and you've paid our house off? Like you've been hiding money from us? But it was, then I was so grateful and I was so proud. The Washington Post calls them the Einstein of economical because they've perfected the formula to get their kids an undergraduate degree on a bargain. Two years of community college because it's about half the price. The tuition's half the price and you can transfer to any Maryland state school. Their children also know not to expect a handout and so far they're all graduating without debt. The parents believe financial freedom is essential for staying open to God's future plans, something they want to share with young couples. I would even like to get, catch them before they go to college because I think that we have so many friends who are going into so much debt after college that when they're either postponing getting married or postponing having children because they have so much college debt. This, this household doesn't claim to be perfect. Sit down at the table, <laughs> I, don't want, wait, I don't want you taking yogurt in the kitchen. In the but knows how God works through their imperfections. Like cars breaking down and, you know, people helping us out in so many different ways. God doesn't say, I got this planned for you. He just says trust and say yes. 
The fat singers remind us to keep family trees rooted in faith and trust God will care for the many branches. We kind of have a joke when our kids are dating and to or getting engaged and I'll be like, okay, what's the secret answer if I ask you, how many kids do you want? It's not, I want seven, I want ten, I want three. It's how many God give me. Rob and Sam Fatsinger make sure to go on a date night every Wednesday. Thank you, Fatsingers, for welcoming me into your home. What a beautiful pro-life witness. That's it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. You can reach us anytime at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. Life is a gift. God bless.